to have the books we're on page five uh, and we have looked at the questions that establish that uh, God has given all truth to the Son through the Spirit uh, and the Spirit has revealed the truth uh, to the Apostles as recorded in the Word and closing out the section discussing uh, the inspired Word being our only guide in religion we've come to 2 Peter 1 3 according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. The question, has God given us all things that pertain to life and godliness? And if He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, then should we uh, be using any other source as our religious authority? What are these questions establishing in the minds of the folks with whom we're studying? The Bible and the Bible only. That's it. Scripture. Uh, again, in previous questions, we've hit on the idea of creed books and manuals and disciplines and all of these other writings that when you step back and look at it, all they are is denominational efforts is giving cliffs notes to Scripture because people are too lazy just to study Scripture. By the way, brethren, we might want to be careful with that too because as we emphasize that the Bible is our only guide in religion, uh, how often is it the case that there are those... Uh, it was Barton Stone that said unwritten creeds are just as dangerous as written ones. How often is it the case that members of the Lord's Church have uh, made their summary statements of Scripture instead of having some memory statements from Scripture? How long have we tried to simplify statements instead of actually learning the depth of the Word? So as we go through this uh, section, it's going to be important for us to be encouraged as well about trusting in the Scriptures and what they actually say instead of just what we've always heard that they said. Go ahead and move forward. Coming to Deuteronomy 4.2. Uh, well, Deuteronomy 4.2. Ye shall not add to his word, neither shall ye diminish aught from it. Would we please God if we added to or deleted anything from his word? No. no. Well, what's that say about the, uh, the urge among so many folks to have creed books and documents, uh, writings of faith that uh, are to be a replacement for Scripture? Is that authorized, pleasing to God? Galatians 1, beginning in verse 6. I marvel that you are so soon from him that called you to the grace of Christ unto another gospel. But there be some that trouble you, pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than what we've preached unto you, let him be accursed. As I said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. Will we be accursed if we add to or take away from the Bible? Okay. The point was made during the lecture series, uh, and you've heard it before from different teachers. But there are some that will want to say, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. But when it comes down to it, it doesn't matter if I believe it or not, the Bible says it, that settles it. And that's the, the point that we're endeavoring to make. Now, the danger of adding to God's Word is illustrated in the next passage that comes from Leviticus 10, referring to Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, that took either of them his censer and put strange fire therein and offered it before the Lord. And as a result, fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them both. The question... These men offered strange fire before the Lord, which He commanded them not. What does that mean, commanded them not? Did God say, thou shalt not offer this, uh, this aroma of incense? Okay. He had not given them permission to offer what they did. He had specifically told them what to give, and they gave something else. Did they alter God's commands? Was God pleased with them? And must we be careful how we handle the Word of God? Okay. We'll go ahead and move forward here. 
Again, we have a, a good bit of uh, ground to cover tonight. Second John verse 9. If any man transgress and abide not in the doctrine of Christ, he hath not God. Whosoever abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. If we do not abide in the doctrine of Christ, is God pleased? Okay. Do you want to please God? That's a gain commitment type question. That's, that's giving someone an opportunity to put some proverbial skin in the game. To say, yes, I do want to please God. Well, that gives an opportunity to say this. Well, if I want to please God, then whose doctrine am I going to hold? The doctrine of Christ? If I want to please God, then am I going to appeal to these other books and documents? Matthew 15, 9. By the way, if you get to this previous question, do you want to please God, and the person says no, you're kind of at a showstopper. Matthew 15, 9. There we go. Uh, but in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. The question says their worship to God was unacceptable because they taught for doctrines, what? The commandments of men. So if we base our rule of faith on what some uninspired man says, is our worship and our practice going to be any more pleasing and, and fruitful than what theirs was? In vain do they worship me. What's it mean to do something in vain? Pointless. And this is a good opportunity to ask that question. What does it mean to do something in vain? Empty. Pointless, useless. Well, if I'm worshiping in vain, what's that mean? It means it's not getting past the ceiling. Just a good question to ask to help, again, uh, arrive at that conclusion. Matthew seven twenty one. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. The question, who will be allowed to enter heaven? They to do the will of the Father. Now what's that called when you do someone else's will? Obey? Submit? Obey? What is it called if you refuse to do someone else's will? Disobedience. So... Is obedience involved in this plan? Just a good thought to drop and a seed to plant at this point. We're not studying what it means to obey the gospel yet, but the emphasis on doing God's will is something that's always good to plant and just uh, as simple as asking is obedience important. Next question is another gain commitment question. Do you want to go to heaven? Well, those that go to heaven are those that do the will of the Father which is in heaven, right? So, we want to do whose will? At this point, we've looked at the fact that looking through the map of Revelation that we've utilized, it starts with God delivering all truth. He gave it to the Son, who gave it to the Holy Spirit, who inspired the prophets and apostles, who wrote the Bible. Now, picking up at the next question... Uh, or the next series of questions, sir. Sure. Ephesians 3, 4. Let's read that one. Ephesians 3, 4.
Paul says, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge of the mysteries of Christ. According to the Apostle Paul, what do we need to do to understand the mysteries of Christ? Read what? Read what Paul wrote. Okay. Where did Paul get his knowledge? By revelation, which, by the way, is said in the previous two verses. When I read what Paul wrote, I can understand what Paul understood. And I don't need Joseph Smith's approach to try to tell me what it means. We can illustrate it this way. Suppose a parent gives one child instruction to give to the other. And the parent says to the older child, uh, tell your younger sister to uh, take a shower. Okay. So the older child goes to the younger child and says, you need to take a shower and you need to set the temperature at just this temperature and you need to make sure that you use this soap and you need to make sure that you use this towel. Is that what the parent said? Is that what the parent said? Okay. Did the older child create rules that the parent did not give? He just thought he needed to expound and expand and explain. What he was actually doing was creating his own level of authority so that he could boss someone around. By the way, there's your Book of Mormon. And there's any other man-made document that's intended to be a document of faith. That illustration will probably not be well received, but that, that illustration at the same time puts into perspective the difference, one, knowing that when we read what God wrote, we can understand what God wanted us to understand, and the claim that the need for anything on top of that is essentially saying that God is an uh, insufficient communicator. Right. Well, and one of the things there is when you're talking to, to those, uh, those 16 year old elders, um, you're talking to people that have been so trained to put all logic to the side um, that reason is seldom going to win the day. Oh, really? You need to write a book. <laughs> um, one other point to be made here. If we need additional writings, by the way, hey, brethren, somewhere along the line we got it in our head that we need to be writing a whole lot of books. Wouldn't it be doing us a lot more good if we'd be studying the Bible more? When we convince ourselves that God needs my help to be understood, then we're saying that he is incapable. Genesis 3, what did the serpent use to convince Eve to take a nibble of that fruit? Words. Just words. That was it, words. Did he need further elaboration or someone else to come, around, come along and write the Satan's commentary so that Eve knew exactly what he meant? Was he able to convince her to sin using just words? Who's a better communicator? God or Satan? Who's a better communicator? So if Satan can convince mankind to sin using just words can god instruct mankind in righteousness using words and using just the ones he gave so those are thoughts that are going to be relevant when those ideas arise and once you presented those thoughts the ones that are unwilling to listen have actually showed their hand and it's that their hand isn't trying to hold god's at all let's go ahead and move forward chris thank you for the comment uh go ahead and move forward we're under which law we have a series of passages here to examine, and we're going to move through these quickly. 
uh, unless Evan says, hey, Scott, hush, I've got a comment. We're going to move through these quickly. Uh, and the reason for that is it's also going to be good to move through these rather succinctly in a study because we can make the mistake of dwelling on just one of these. And anyone ever heard of Pandora's box? You ever opened it a time or two? Yeah. Uh, if we will simply read the verses and answer the question pertaining to the verse, they may ask other questions. And it's going to be good as we move through here to say, that's a good question, let's jot it down. That's a good question, let's hold on to that. Because there's a line of thought being developed here that with many people can bear zero distraction, zero uh, redirection. So, we are under which law? Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by thee, hath in these last days spoken to us by his there are the answers to those two questions. God spoke to the fathers by the prophets. Today, He has spoken through His Son. Now, the person here that says, well, how does God speak through His Son? We've already covered that. He, he spoke through His Son. His Son spoke through His apostles. Uh, that's been discussed in the passages that have already been studied. So, we go ahead and move forward. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. How much authority did God give to Jesus? All. So the Father has spoken through His Son. The Son has all authority, which means we need to hear what who says. We need to heed the words of Christ. John 12, 48, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words has one that judges him. The word that I've spoken, the same will judge him in the last day. According to that passage, we will be judged by the words of Christ. Pause. Am I going to be judged by the words of mama? By the words of best friend? By the words of Oprah? Am I going to be judged by the words of uh, Confucius or Buddha? I'm going to be judged by the words of Christ. Am I going to be judged by the words of Congress? Christ. I'm going to be judged by the words of Christ. So, moving forward, having emphasized the importance of His words, John 1.17, the law was given by... But grace and truth came by. Here's a point to make at, at, at this juncture. John 1, 17. Does the Bible distinguish between what Moses brought and what Jesus brought? The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Christ. Now, there's grace and truth in the law of Moses, let there be no doubt. But the point to make here is that there is a distinction made between the law that Moses brought and what Christ brought. We go ahead and move forward. This time, Hebrews 9, picking up at verse 15. Wherefore, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the remission of of the transgressions that were under the Old Covenant, or the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of an eternal inheritance. For where there uh, is a testament, there must of necessity be the death of the testator. Pause. That doesn't say the death of the test taker, teachers. That says the death of the testator. Uh, verse uh, 16, the, the point being made that uh, a covenant is of effect as long as a man lives. In other words, what has to happen for a, uh, a covenant to take, take effect? Death. So, is Jesus the mediator of the New Testament? And when did the New Testament of Jesus go into effect? At His death. You might refer to a last will and testament. Many people will be familiar with that. 
If you're talking to someone about the age of 35 or below, chances are they're not. We have some exceptions. We've got some good younger adults here. But generally speaking, in our society today, there are some folks that just don't have a clue what a will and testament is. Uh, some folks that are older are going to be more familiar with the concept. Hebrews 8, picking up at verse 6. But now he's the... Now I've lost... He's obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is a mediator of the better covenant, which was established upon better promises. If that first covenant had been faultless, there should no place have been sought for the second. Is Jesus the mediator of a better covenant? Better than what? He's the mediator of a new one and a better one, so it must be better than the old one, the first one. All right. Next question. If that first covenant, the Old Testament, had been faultless, would God have given us the second covenant, the New Testament? No. There, there would have been no place sought for it, no reason. And it's at this point the astute student will say, wait a minute, does that mean God gave an imperfect law? Well, what was the fault if the first covenant had been faultless? Hebrews 8.8 8 says, for finding fault with them. The fault was not in the law. The law was perfect. The law accomplished exactly what God intended it to accomplish. The law was never intended to justify. The law was never intended to make man fully right with God. The law was intended to prepare man for Christ who would. The, the law was perfect in what it was intended to achieve. Beyond that, the fault lay not with the law, but with the people that really didn't follow it. Hebrews 8.13. Next question. In that he said the new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which is waxen old is ready to vanish away. The question accompanying this passage when God gave the new covenant, did he make the first one old, no longer in force, outdated, expired, finished? Those are just some other words that might be added to help stress the point. So, the first was old, no longer in force. Acts 13, picking up at verse 38. This is the Apostle Paul preaching to a group of Hebrews as well as some proselytes that are there. But he makes the point in preaching to them. Let's move that forward. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, by, that by this man is preached unto you uh, the forgiveness of sins, and that by him all that believe are justified, from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. According to the Bible, Acts 13.39 can we be justified by the law of Moses? Okay. Now the next question has got to be this before we move forward. What's the law of Moses? Old law. Old Testament. Which includes what? Well, what, what used to be the big debate about people not wanting to have it posted? Our society has plummeted so far now that We'd be shocked if someone would even consider posting the Ten Commandments. We just don't want them to post pictures of men dressed as women. But the debate at one point was the Ten Commandments. Okay. Should we be, uh, should we have a certain honor for, respect toward, appreciation of the Ten Commandments? Okay. At the same time, the Ten Commandments are part of which law? Which testament, old or new? Okay. Let's move forward. Galatians 3, verses 11 through 12. But the law is not of faith. Uh, for the law says, The man that doeth them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it's written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on the tree. Is the law of faith? No. Now, the way this question is worded requires a, 
a little bit of a familiarity with putting the emphasis on the right syllable, so to speak, in reading Galatians 3, 11, and 12. The, the question doesn't say, is the law of faith? Well, there is a law of faith, but the point being made here is, is the law of Moses the same thing as the faith? No. The law of Moses, especially the way the Jews followed it, was uh, a law that stressed outward action and a meritorious mindset. Not because that was God's plan for it, but because that's the way the Jews had abused it. And that's the way that those who were still trying to bind it, we're in Galatians 3, those that were still trying to bind it were using it the same way as some kind of meritorious idea. Is the law of faith? No, especially not the way man had used it. Did Christ redeem us from the curse of the law? Redeem us from the curse of the law. Well, if we're redeemed from the curse of the law, then are we under that law? Two more passages before we make a couple of uh, additional comments. We go to Colossians 2.14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, taking it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. When was the bond written in ordinances abolished? At the cross, when Jesus was nailed to the cross. He took out of the way the, the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, that was contrary to us. Now, someone might have a couple of questions at this point. This will be a good time to say, you know, we're going to hit on that in just a moment. Let's read another passage. Ephesians 2.15. Ephesians 2.15, having, having abolished the... Enmity, that is the uh, law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make him himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Now, according to Ephesians 2.15, what did Jesus abolish in his flesh? How is it worded in Ephesians 2.15? The law of commandments contained in ordinances. That's going to be really important to stress. There was a law of commandments. What, what do you think this law of commandments might have been? Oh, the law that hinged on the Ten Commandments? Now, wait a minute. Does that mean that it's okay now to, uh, to, uh, to worship idols, to kill, to lie? There are different ways to illustrate this. One short and sweet statement can be the fact that uh, all of those moral injunctions of the law of Moses and the Ten Commandments are stressed in the New Testament as well. You could simply go to Ephesians 4 and 5, Colossians 3, and in just those passages you get repeated emphases on nine of the Ten Commandments. Now we say nine of the Ten Commandments because there was one of the commandments that is not bound upon Christians. What's that? The Sabbath. The point to make here is this. The law of Christ also has a moral code that prevents me from slaughtering my neighbor indiscriminately. The law of Christ also has a moral code that prevents me from being dishonest and lying. The law of Christ has a moral code that opposes adultery and covetousness. Theft. So, Galatians 3, picking up at verse 23. Oh, actually, yeah, we already answered that. Galatians 3. Wherefore the law is our schoolmaster to lead us unto Christ. But after that faith has come, we're no longer under the schoolmaster. Now we'll drop a tent peg right here. We've got a couple of minutes. The word translated schoolmaster. You don't have to memorize this. The Greek word is pedagogos. Now, you can remember it by just saying pet, a, gogos, whatever a gogos is. A uh, pedagogos. The literal meaning is a servant that was entrusted to lead the children, some say to school, 
but really it was a servant that was entrusted to lead the underage uh, children of a household throughout their day. And the pedagogos was to be with the children uh, throughout the entirety of their day. Now, if he led them to school, then he left them at the school. But he was to be with them throughout the entirety of the day. They wouldn't leave the house without the pedagogos until they were full grown. If you just want to think of it in terms of leading them to school, who is it that takes children to school today? Bus driver. Is the bus driver's job to do all the teaching? Is the bus driver the chemistry teacher? No. After that faith has come, we're no longer under the schoolmaster. Once the bus arrives at school, are the children supposed to stay on the bus? According to Galatians 3, has the bus arrived? After that faith has come, we're no longer under the schoolmaster. The schoolmaster is used as a figure for what in this passage? The law. No longer under the schoolmaster means no longer under the law. Now, so someone's saying, well, so we don't have to follow the law of Moses? We're not under the law of Moses? Let's look at two more verses that are very close together. Romans 7, beginning in verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. According to Paul, we are become blank to the law, dead, dead to the law by the body of Christ. Now, Romans 7, 6, Paul says, Now we, we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, we should serve in newness of the spirit, not oldness of the letter. Paul says we are what to the law in verse 6? Delivered from the law. If we're dead to it and delivered from it, then are we still under it? Now, before we go to the next question, we're in Romans 7, right? Just to remove all doubt, someone read verse 7 for us. Romans 7, 7. What law said thou shalt not covet? Law of Moses. Matter of fact, thou shalt not covet. You're going to find that in Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments. So what law is Paul discussing in Romans 7 when he says we are dead to the law? What law is he discussing when he says we're delivered from the law? Which brings us to the next question. Is the New Testament the law spiritually binding today? All right. Now, those things being said, uh, this is not the point to start stressing that uh, all of the de differences between the Old Testament worship and the New Testament worship, the groundwork is laid for emphasizing that we're under the new law, and the further details of that will be expounded in later studies. Evan, what do you have to add, sir? Okay, very quickly. Um, I had two things that I just wanted to touch on. The first is uh, the simplicity of going through this study to lay the groundwork is um, crucial for the following studies. Um, what Scott has done is, is a really good job of maybe adding one or two things in here or there and uh, build your expectations or build their expectations by doing that. Um, oh, what was I going to add here? Oh, also, next week, Scott is not going to be here. So it's just going to be me. So be prepared for the best class of your life. Um, so please be here then for that. Uh, there, are, there are a few things when going through here. You'll write down questions that people ask you. And I just want to stress again um, to defer as much as possible and say just wait till the end. But, but when you get to the part that we just got here, if they have questions, this would be a good time to talk to them about those questions. And if you don't know the answer, 
or if it's about the nuance of how we worship, say, that's the next, that's uh, number two. We're going to get into the organization of the church and how we worship and, and why we do it the way that we do it. So it's still time. If you know what number two is and number three, there's still some wiggle room to say, well, let's wait and let's get to that uh, tomorrow or whatever. So um, this was really, really good. Thank you, Scott.